Here we are, the Beer Idiots, with Pierre Olivier Bergeron. Good You're to see you again. Good to see you again. Uh, where is the beer industry now? We, we met last in 2019. That is the year before COVID. And I wish I could tell you, well, everything's back to normal. But uh, some things are back to normal, but we're not there yet. I mean, if you zoom in figures when it comes to beer production across Europe, uh, beer consumption, um, we do hear more and more positive reports when it comes to 2022 figures in comparison with 2019, but the figures are still uh, below uh, the 2019 uh, figures. And I'm talking here about, again, about uh, overall production across Europe and overall consumption. Now, if you zoom in even more, um, one of the big uh, conundrums we've, we've had to address as brewers was the crisis in the hospitality sector. You know, from one day to another, uh, bars, restaurants and cafes closing. And, you know, what this meant for the beer sector for almost two years, 2020, 2021, was that in, you know, in, in a matter of days, uh, about one third of the business, uh, of the beer business was basically vanishing, because if you look at the average part played by uh, beer in the hospitality sector, uh, it's, it's exactly that. It's about, on average, uh, one third of the beer sales uh, occurring in the hospitality sector. So you can imagine that those brewers relying a lot on, on the hospitality sector were hit like never before. Um, and when you look at you know, indicators like the number of breweries across Europe, uh, for example, um, as another indicator on top of uh, production and consumption. Interestingly enough, the, num the overall number of breweries has not decreased, uh, but uh, I think that the main message here is that before COVID, uh, the trend towards, you know, creation of, of new breweries was just fantastic. I mean, I think that at some point we counted about two new breweries a day uh, uh, um, opening uh, in Europe. And, and, and of course, that didn't happen uh, during COVID. But, th but there was no net uh, decrease. But of course, th th there were a number of breweries which could not survive. But the thing is that we've had COVID. We've tried to address COVID the best we could, big and small. Um, just think about all the schemes which the brewers put in place in order to actually help the Orica and the hospitality sector. But then he, almost immediately after the kind of end of the big COVID, I would call it like that, um, prices started to uh, increase a lot, right from September 2021. Prices of raw materials, prices of packaging materials, and around the at the end of 2021, I would regularly hear uh, reports from brewers saying, uh, where am I going to find my aluminum for the cans? How am I going to uh, pay for the, the, the uh, malting barley to you know, come in the brewery? So there were already kind of you know, uh, tensions uh, um, at that time. And then the war in Ukraine, which actually, you know, added an extra, huge extra layer of constraints on, on the brewing sector. So it was a huge stress test. Huge stress, um, energy prices, raw materials, prices and availability. Although in Europe we were, from that point of view, relatively protected. Then we had last summer uh, a big, big issue with um, carbon dioxide. Yes. Um, and it was, you know, literally a situation where I would get phone calls from Germany, from Belgium, from Holland, from the UK saying, you know, can we do something on the European level to address this? And we did our best as a European organization. I mean, we elevated the issue to the, the, the highest uh, uh, instances in the Parliament, in the European Commission, uh, whereby we said, you know, uh, this energy crisis is hitting brewers for, from many angles, from many point of views, but points of view. But one uh, issue is carbon dioxide uh, availability. This is now calming down. Um, I think that, you know, brewers 
all we, and, and it's not a matter of size of breweries here. It's mm -hmm. really, a, uh, I think, a common trend in the, in the mindset of brewers. They try, of course, to anticipate and they try to find alternative solutions to innovate. So then it may become, for certain breweries, an issue of you know, uh, actual uh, money power to invest in innovative systems that would help them circumvent the issues of, for example, uh, carbon dioxide availability, but but there are systems which actually help you as a brewer to um, maintain uh, your capacity in carbon dioxide so that you don't find yourself in, in, in the end like stuck with no carbon dioxide anymore. And and when people think about carbon dioxide and beer, they, they think about uh, you know, serving yeah, beer, but, but it's not only that. It's, yeah. you know, you need that also for the brewing process, you need that... Sorry? For cleaning as well. For cleaning, exactly. Right. So it's been a big issue and, um, and it, it, it seems to be that now this is calming down. Um, oh, that's really good uh, to know. But, yeah. um, but, but, but the energy crisis is not over and then as individual citizens and individual consumers, we know that. And that's so, also affecting the horeca sector. And right? that's as, okay, absolutely you know, affecting the horeca sector. But as long as the energy crisis is not over, um, there will be, you know, uh, uncertainties. I guess it's different, uh, as we know, for the bigger brewers, which can survive the impact, and then the medium-sized, and of course the smaller and nano brewers, mainly going towards the craft industry. It's surprising to me how resilient the smaller side was. You know, they found a new market in consumers drinking at home. For the bigger brewers, I guess they have uh, economies of scale. They're able to adapt a bit, but. Not that much. You see some of them changing strategy. I mean, strategy. there are, yes, you're right. There are limits to, the, to that. Um, and, 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 and when you think about countries where, for example, um, the, the um, uh, bit of um, hospitality uh, is, is absolutely huge, then, you know, everybody struggles, big, small, and medium. So take a country like Spain or, or Ireland, uh, or Portugal, uh, where um, hospitality is about 70, sometimes oh. even 80% of the market. Can you imagine? That's about basically 80% of the volumes are actually consumed uh, on trade. Okay. Uh, then, you know, it's, it's an issue for everybody. It's right. an issue for everybody. Well, what are some of the general measures that you're advocating uh, to help, whether it's policy or whether it's strategy. Yeah. I mean, during COVID, we, we advocated for a, a next size duty regime that would uh, have to be favorable to brewers, especially on, uh, on kegs, so that, you know, um, the kegs that would be lost in the system would not uh, lead the brewer to have to pay excise duties on a product that would ultimately not be consumed. And uh, many, many countries actually applied that measure. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was obviously a big relief, a relief on the hospitality and, uh, and a relief on, on, on the brewers. Um, then some countries were smart enough also to revisit the VAT rates, revisit meaning lower the VAT rates of, for the beer uh, served in, in, in hospitality. I think that, you know, that was a very, very smart measure because in, in the end, it did not mean a loss of revenue for, for the state uh, because when consum consumption started again, then, you know, uh, the coffers of the state would, would uh, fill yeah, in again. Yeah, that's a very so, typical tax, tax um, strategy. Yeah, right? and tax and exactly. And, and we, I say we also on the European level because all these tax measures, in the end, they are taken by the member states, of course. But the actual um, ground law is adopted here. So member states are allowed to do a certain of things as long as Brussels is okay with this. So we, we had to you know, put the stuff again on the table of Brussels saying, you need to tell member states that they can do this or they can do that. Right, it's not a subsidy to the industry, it's a support. It's a support. Talking of subsidies, we also uh, encouraged members to monitor uh, the exceptional regime that was put in place with respect to state aids. Yeah. Um, and um, I know that in certain countries uh, there were breweries which actually used that. Um, then, of course, you know, it, it, in the end, it's also a balancing act because if you 
if you have recourse to state aid, at some point you need to give the money back. Yes. So, uh, but 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 it did help, you know, uh, breweries to to survive or or, or groups of, brewer, of breweries to to survive. Um, another, I think another um, another kind of strand we used was, you know, it's certainly not the time to put the onus on the brewers uh, um, with additional regulatory measures that would, in the end, you know kill uh, the breweries or impact their operations to the extent that they would not survive. So, and that covers many, many regulatory areas like uh, consumer information, you know, um, uh, packaging, packaging waste, so sustainability at large. And we are actually right now in the middle of a uh, big um, uh, legislative exercise at EU level with the uh, adoption um, at some point within the next couple of years of a uh, f big, big review of the packaging and packaging waste uh, mm -hmm. legislation. And there, um, our stance is, well, uh, you know, um, we, we con as brewers, we contribute a lot to environmental sustainability. We've been extremely innovative on primary packaging, secondary packaging, tertiary packaging. We have our specificities. Yeah. Um, you know, if you think of a keg, a keg is a very good example of a sustainable packaging. It's relatively big, uh, so it means it contains a number of uh, letters in volume. Uh, so you, you know, I mean, 50 letters, uh, divide this by a 33 centiliter bottle and you have the, you, you, you have the, <laughs> yeah. the balance between a keg yeah, and a series. Yeah, there's been a lot of work. Um, I know we've talked to some brewers about recycling and keg recycling. And yeah, how they're so, and, and, you know, it's, it's when, so if you think of kegs, they're really a, 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 next, a case study for, you know, the right thing to do when it comes to providing consumers with good stuff in good packaging. Uh, and sustainable packaging, because before recycling a keg, what happens in reality? It happens that the keg will be on the market, reused and reused and reused, something like for 30 years. That's not bad, mm -hmm. you know? And you've uh, lightweighted them as well, I think. Exactly, so um, that's for one thing, yeah. uh, which is, which is uh, of course, important. And then, yeah, we have quite a number of other items we want to draw the attention of the Parliament and the Council of Ministers to on the basis of the uh, draft that was produced by the European Commission to make sure that in the end brewers are treated fairly mm -hmm. uh, in a non-discriminatory uh, manner. I mean brewers have invested a lot in many many markets not just in recycling but also in reuse. Yeah. Uh, so if in the end what would be adopted on the European level would actually kind of jeopardize or, or uh, negatively impact the systems that are in place that work well, you know, and everybody understands the system and the brewers are happy with it. It's not too expensive, it's affordable, it's uh, functional, consumers understand the system. Then why, why would a, a European uh, new set of rules uh, ultimately impact on that? So we, we pay great attention to that. And it means that this afternoon, uh, two of my colleagues will be in the parliament explaining and explaining again uh, our point. So I think that we have quite a number of points of attention whereby we, you know, we um, have, I think, good arguments uh, to persuade uh, regulators that beer needs to be treated fairly. And after all, beer is part of the European patrimony, you know, and it's part of our daily kind of relationship to life. Uh, and sometimes, you know, people, uh, zoom out a little bit too much and say, well, with alcoholic beverages, well, alcoholic beverages, as it happens, beer can be an alcoholic beverage. It can also be a non-alcoholic beverage, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. And, uh, and this is something which is also, I think, a heavy trend now. We might have discussed this uh, back in 2019. Yeah, it was just starting when in 2019. But it was starting. And now, you know, it, four years ago, probably in certain markets, uh, non-alcohol was, or low alcohol was, kind of already part of the um, portfolio or part of the landscape. And, and, and in, you know, very traditional markets where until relatively recently, non-alcoholic beer was kind of considered as oof, not yeah. really, <laughs> <It wasn't> really <laughs> not really of interest. Um, I think perceptions are changing. 
Uh, and you're right to say that this is obviously also, and perhaps primarily in the end, because of the fact that brewers have managed to innovate in such a way yeah. that they are now able to put on the market very palatable yes. um, and, and a, in, a, an interesting drink which has many characteristics of an alcoholic beer, but actually without the alcohol. <laughs> and uh, there was a study um, produced by the um, European Commission or published by the European Commission, yes. the Agriculture uh, uh, services uh, some weeks ago, and they 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 confirmed that when 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 you look at the beer category, um, the majority of people who actually consume non-alcoholic beer, they they see that as part of the of the range. Yes. Um, and 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 it's not alcoholic. Uh, sorry, it's not non-alcohol versus alcohol. It's basically as a consumer, I have that as part of the range. And if I want to choose for you know, a non-alcoholic beer, I'll do that because I find it smart. It, it, it fits with my, my, my obligations, for example, my or my menu, or my taste. Or it, and, and, and it's not necessarily systematically for health reasons. It's, it's part of, yeah, it, it's out there and it's good. So we drink it. And that, that's what's amazing about, I guess, the beer sector is yeah. that small homeowners, you can start in a garage. It's a bit like music in a way. Yeah. It's open to, yeah. a, you know, even though we know the big brewers yeah. dominate, there's yeah. room for everyone. And that's what's there's room for everyone. And uh, like one um, pretty large brewer told me once, uh, he said, you know, we're, nowadays we're an inter international company, but we started... Uh, like you know, a family uh, brewery uh, with uh, a few hectoliters, and then we grew because yeah, then when we we managed, um, and uh, that is something also I find fascinating. You know, I I, I was uh, a couple of years ago in France, where actually you do find uh, nowadays the biggest number of breweries yeah, in yeah, Europe. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I go to the Little Beer Festival, and it's yeah, just amazing how yeah, it grows. Over you know? over yeah. two thousand breweries, yeah. and and that happening in in a wine uh, country, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, and um, and um, yeah, the, the, I did meet um, actually brewers who were starting the business and you know, kind of looking at others and saying, well, am I going to succeed and am I going to find my way? Uh, will I have, shall I have my niche? And, uh, and a, few, a few years later, you, you, you see them um, very okay, having found their market. Um, um, but uh, again, yeah, there there is a sense of fragility, yes. nevertheless, huh? uh, because of the because of all the externalities that have come almost kind of all together, and uh, you know, really. Uh, I also think that um, there is still a, con a concern in the breweries um, around uh, the fact that you know. During two years, I mean, basically, you know, cafes were and restaurants yeah. were closed, so it created a lot of stress. And um, and the question, the next question was, are my customers going to go back? You know. Yeah. Uh, and 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 here I I hear actually various reports. I mean, people saying, yeah, it's almost back to normal, and some others saying we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, that's one thing. One, another thing which actually started some years ago, with, but which has amplified, is that what I also find fascinating when looking at the range of beers and the beer styles uh, is that um, the new, what I call the new brewers, uh, they, you know, the, the new, the new kids <laughs> on the block, well, the kids on the block. Uh, they. Um, they're not necessarily obsessed with specialty beers no. nowadays. Yeah. Uh, so I met once uh, a young brewer here in Brussels. He told me, you know, I, if I was able one day to produce the best lager no, that's what they're in trying Brussels, to do yeah. I would be, you know, the happiest man on, on, on earth because it's complicated and, yes. uh, um, you know, and then you, 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 you need stability, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I also find that interesting. Now you're, of course, the push is to get volumes up, but we can see from your statistics that uh, per capita drinking in many countries is falling. 
or lowering. Uh, how do you reconcile the two trends? Well, I think that the, you know, to a certain extent, the brewers they have kind of integrated this, um, and you do find many brewers tell, saying, you know, I, I'm not I'm not going to be obsessed with volumes, but I will make sure that in the end, uh, my 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 consumers or potentially potentially new uh, clientele or new consumers will find value for money. And, uh, and, and I think that you know, the, the trend towards premiumization is, is out there as well. Yeah. Uh, you are right to say that probably COVID uh, led to a situation where people would actually be ready to invest a little bit more in, the, you know, in, 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 in their beer. Uh, so to what extent are, do we find here a, a kind of net compensation? That is a bit difficult to say. Um, but yes, of course, I mean, in general, you want to produce volume. Yeah. Uh, but I think that uh, COVID probably has uh, led brewers to factor in perhaps other elements in their equation. And, uh, you know, if I can't achieve uh, volume, then I can perhaps look at this from another angle, which is obviously value. Right. And for exports, how is that? I mean... You have the big brewers who are exporters by nature, yeah. but in terms of the middle, the rest of the market, are exports, do they see the export market as a... Yeah, it's been, I mean, exports have been uh, now, um, I was going to say a long trade, uh, I would say even a, a heavy trend. Um, when I joined the brewing sector uh, some years ago, <laughs> uh, Typically, I would hear people telling me, uh, you know, exports in the beer side. I mean, beer is local. Uh, you, don't, you don't really, um, I mean, exports are a little bit kind of marginal apart from certain brands uh, in comparison with spirits, for example, where, yes. you know, spirits, you know, there, there are certain spirits categories where basically 98% of the products are exported. Right. Um, but, but, um, but if you see countries like Belgium, for example, I think that, that there are many, many breweries which have managed to survive thanks to exports. Yes. Do you see any other consumer trends or industry trends that are, you know, you can see starting up or? I would say, um, well, at first glance, it's, um, it's basically the continuation of, of uh, trends which we had identified already half a decade ago, that is, you know, the expansion of the beer portfolio uh, due to innovation and actually quality. So I think that um, we're, you know, I, 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 if you look at the average percentage of uh, non-alcohol, um, low alcohol in Europe, it's around 6% uh, right. nowadays. It's co going to continue to grow. I'm not saying that this will go to, this would take place to the detriment of specialty beers, but it's basically an expansion of the, of the, beer, of the beer category. And I think that uh, that, that is a, an existing trend, but it's probably only starting. Uh, in general, you know, if you take the Green Deal, European Green Deal, we support it. Right. Because we are fully aware of the fact that in one way or another, we have to address climate change and that brewers are part of the solution. As you know, the, the brewers are generally not starting from scratch. I mean, there are many dimensions in environmental sustainability when it comes to beer. So, for example, um, uh, water use is uh, one of the big uh, subjects. And, and you're, I'm sure, absolutely aware of the fact that, yeah, had we had this conversation 15 years ago, we would have said, yeah, well, you need quite a number of liters of water to, uh, to produce beer. But that, th there's been... Uh, such an amount, an extent of innovation there where, whereby, you know, uh, uh, some brewers are now able to, uh, to go even below three liters to yeah. produce a, a one liter. I mean, that, that is absolutely remarkable. Um, but, you know, I, 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 it's really, if you look at the, all the different stages of the brewing process, which, by the way, is a complex one, and at first sight, indeed, energy intensive, uh, yeah, I think that for each stage, brewers are trying to find solutions. Uh, I refer to carbon dioxide. I mean, there are solutions, and sometimes a bit costly, so that may be an issue for some brewers. But then th I think that probably moving forward, there will be less and less costly, uh, costly solutions. Um, when it comes to packaging, um, 
there is a, a, a lot of innovation out there, you know. Um, recyclable, we, we refer to recyclable kegs, uh, um, 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 but um, the, um, uh, we, we have a conversation nowadays on, um, uh, with the parliament on uh, the so-called shrink wraps, you know, uh, yes. um, and, uh, and, and some members of parliament didn't realize that uh, the vast majority nowadays of shrink wraps are 100% recy recycled. So, uh, and this is because brewers have done a lot. Some countries are now starting to crack down, not just on advertising for beer, but even just uh, blogs or, or uh, people talking about yes. alcohol beer. Is I mean, this, a uh, problem the, in terms of, this yeah, is there's a free speech issue, obviously. Yeah. But there's also a limitation in how much, you know, it's putting a block for consumers to learn. I think it's going to be. Um, it's always been a topic, you know, I mean, alcohol policy at large, and you, you always find people who, are, who believe that they are extremely smart in uh, banning um, communications, um, believing probably very naively that uh, this will basically kill consumption, that sort of thing. Uh, our point there is um, banning advertising is not going to help. Um, having decent rules to make sure that the advertising is okay and that is you know respectful of the consumer and respectful of the law that is the right approach uh, and you are very right to say that uh, those regulators who um, uh, would uh, take measures probably not realizing all the impact uh, but believing that uh, yeah banning advertising is going to be the panacea uh, what they don't realize is that they are killing for example, small brewers, because as you said, I mean, there are, there are brewers uh, who only communicate to their customers via a website or a blog or, or so, but you are referring to Lithuania. Lithuania no, is just one example. Yeah. yeah, it's one example, but it's actually, it happens to be a country where there has always been a lot of imagination uh, <laughs> from, uh, from, from that point of view. Um, but um, our role is also to make sure that um, this does not become a kind of European mantra whereby Europe should uh, um, uh, should um, be much more stringent vis-à-vis -vis alcoholic beverages, including beer. Uh, and there, our, our point is, you know, it's probably not a coincidence if in certain countries you find more restrictions on uh, hard liquor than on beer. Um, and uh, we support that because I think that um, we're talking about two different products there. Yes. Uh, so, uh, countries, for example. Exactly. So, if uh, you know, if an age limit is lower in one country for beer uh, versus other drink, uh, beer and wine versus uh, spirits, for example, we, we support that. Um, and uh, and I think that um, I think that probably regulators should look into this as well. You know, not necessarily thinking alcohol all all the way, but uh, perhaps kind of approaching certain products differently. Great, and so let's end on a positive note for the forum. I guess it's going to be, we're going to talk about what's on the upside. We're now out of a, I guess, a depression and it's yes, I mean, more upside. Yes, I mean, you're right. I mean, when we had the forum in Madrid last year, I mean, en route to the, to the forum in Madrid, we had concerns. We said to ourselves, oh, it's going to be the first forum uh, after two years, uh, you know, one year without a forum, one year with a, with a virtual forum. Yes. Uh, the virtual forum was uh, a big success, actually. Um, many, many people connected. So we, for us, it was the, basically the, the, the message was the connection is out there and people are, you know, they want to continue to connect. Um, Madrid was a success um, and, and, and Prague is going to be a success as well. Um, I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, also, when looking at uh, what we offer in terms of content, so, and we're a little bit obsessed, and I say we, I shouldn't say this because I'm not really involved in the program. I can inspire it perhaps to a certain extent, but those who've been working on the programs, I think that their, their line is, um, if I'm, um, um, as I said, a new kid on the block or a relatively experienced brewer, but perhaps kind of wishing to uh, develop or understand new trends or a large brewer, uh, 
uh, wishing to understand what is actually the, the overall landscape of beer, um, uh, then my, I, I'm going to be able to find sessions during the forum which actually are right, you know, uh, to the addressing my, 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 my issues. And I, this is what I like about the forum. I mean, you, if you're interested in um, sustainable hop solutions, you'll find a session on that. Yes. If you want to uh, revisit your approach to yeast, you'll find something on that. But you could also have a preference for non uh, you know, the development of the non-alcohol and low-alcohol category. There will be a session on that, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that it's also a unique opportunity for networking, of course, but you could say that for many other events. But I think that one of the beauties of the, of the forum is that it's European, it's multi-brewer, uh, so it's not, you know, one family of brewers versus another, it's let's, let's talk about beer. And let's get together. And let's get together, um, and, let's, and, and so I, I will have a conversation with my colleague um, from the Brewers Association uh, during the forum, and, and, and we are very aligned, he, he and I, on the fact that, yeah, the agenda is beer. It's beer, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And uh, it's defending and promoting and, uh, and trying and the product and, and trying to secure the, the best future possible. Uh, and that can only happen if you go out of your brewery sometimes uh, and, and realize that there is a lot of thing, there are lots of things that you can learn from, from each other. Thanks for this. Uh, You're welcome. Time. And see you, see you at the forum. See you in Prague. <laughs>